All right, so I'll call to order this April 17th, 2018 meeting, or workshop rather, of the Powhatan County School Board. Ms. Wilson, if you'll let the minutes reflect that uh, Ms. Emel, Mr. Cole, me, Ms. Ayers, and Dr. Jones are present along with our student liaison, Ms. Brindley. Mr. Kunko, we will be uh, acting in a moment, uh, taking a motion in a moment uh, regarding his potential participation electronically, but he is not present with us at this time. Are there any changes, deletions, additions that needed to be made to the agenda for the workshop? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion. We amend the agenda uh, to add Mr. Kunka as for remote participation. Uh, All right, is there a second to Mr. Cole's motion to permit Mr. Kunka to participate electronically this evening? Mr. Kunka is in Philadelphia, as I understand. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please respond with aye. 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 Motion carries 4-0. And Mr. Kunkel will join us when he uh, overcomes the technological challenges he's <laughs> dealing with at this point. So that takes us to the public comment period for the evening. Uh, I'm sorry, you're cor you are exactly correct. So is there a motion to approve the uh, amended agenda with the addition of item? Is there a motion to approve the amended agenda? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd make a motion to approve the uh, amended agenda. Second. Is there a second? All in favor, say aye. 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 So the amended agenda is approved 4-0. All right, and just so procedurally we're in place at this point, we have now approved the amended agenda, and let's take up the item about Mr. Cole participating just so we're in the proper order. So, Mr. Cole, you made, would you make a motion, sir, that we permit Mr. Cole to participate, or Mr. Conker to permit, participate electronically? Yes, sir. All right. Motion to... Mr. Kunker approved. All right, so now that we're in the proper order, we've approved our agenda, we have our motion. There's a second to Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole's motion. Second. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 4-0 for Mr. Kunker to participate electronically. That puts us in the proper posture. That takes us to the public comment period for the evening. I have an update on Mr. Kunker, I believe. Mr. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we certainly gave it a quite a bit of effort to permit, it, to permit him to participate electronically. So we wish him safe travels. All right. Public comment period. So this is the public comment period for the workshop this evening. This period provides an opportunity for individuals or delegations wishing to comment publicly to the board to do so. There is a time limit of three minutes per individual and one minute, I'm sorry, five minutes per group. Uh, there is a time, total time limit of 30 minutes for this public comment period. Anyone wishing to come forward and speak, please identify yourself by name and to the board. We would also ask if you would please provide your address for our, our notes and records. Public comment period is open for anyone that wishes to speak to the board about any issue in front of the board this evening or any other issue. Good evening, Mary Good evening. Smith, 2573 Ridge Road, Powhatan, Virginia. Um, I just uh, want to say a few things. I have lived all over the U.S. and nothing compares to Powhatan County. Um, we are the a very unique county as in we look out for our own. We um, are very tight-knit and I just feel like bringing in a company is going to make us feel more commercialized. Um, I understand the financial end of it and I understand it's not the quality of our work. Um, but. I just want the board to realize that, the, um, w that we go above and beyond. We just don't have relationships as far as knowing the kids' names and being courteous to them, but we go beyond that. <clears throat> For instance, I had a child that is a kindergartner, and I know that this might not sound like a big deal to adults, but for a child, it is a very big deal. This child came in on a Friday she waited all week to get her ice cream. And she was short some money. And I reached into a drawer where I keep extra change and I put that on her account. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, honey, you can't get your ice cream because you don't have enough money. I did that. And just a whole lot of other things. I don't have time because I only have three minutes. But that is just one example that that's what we make as Powhatan. You know, that's what Powhatan is. 
we look, you know, we look out for each other and our children. And yes, I understand that we may be hired by this company, but I'm not sure as far as the hours or days or anything else that I'm going to be able to work with the company because it just depends on my life. The job itself, I'm not too sure about. A lot of, there's a lot of unknown questions that haven't been answered. So even though we may be hired, doesn't mean we're all going to be able to because of our lifestyles. Um, there's, that's why I work for the school is because I'm able to have summers off. I'm able to be off when my kids are off. And I understand that that may be the same, but I also understand that there may be a little bit more that is asked upon us than we are used to. Also, just please remember what happened to the custodians. Most of them started out, and, and, and most of them have not, in, most of them have in not, are not with the company that they started with when they were with the school system, and the turnover has been pretty great. And, oops, there's my time. Sorry. Um, just remember, all that's glitter is not gold. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other speakers for public comment period this evening? The floor is open. Any other speakers for the public comment period? All right, seeing none, I'll bring the public comment period to a close. Dr. Jones, I believe that takes us to a series of presentations this evening. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first item is a school safety update uh, after the um, tragedy in Parkland, Florida. Um, the board is aware that uh, there were a lot of questions from the community, um, a lot of information um, shared with us and feedback shared with us, and the board requested to get an update of um, our school safety procedures that we have in place um, and to partner with the sheriff's office to do that. So I'm going to ask Katie Wojcicki and Jason Tibbs to come up, and um, we'll be joined shortly. Um, oh, I can see you over there. Um, Sheriff Nunnally is here, um, and um, um, other officers are going to be assisting with the presentation. Mr. Sergeant Wright is also here um, th to help us with the presentation and to talk about the partnership that we have with the Sheriff's Office um, as well. And Brett Connor's over there as well. Yes. How are you doing, Ms. Connor? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Emo. I can't see over there. <laughs> Ms. Wojcicki? Thank you for having us tonight. Um, we're pleased and excited to be able to share with you an update of what we've been doing with safety this year in um, the schools. And we have a great partnership with our, our sheriff's department. And so um, you'll get to hear from them directly what we've been doing as well. So, and I wanted to point out, Brett, you are on the presentation, whether you knew it or not. Yeah, there you are. You're right there. <laughs> um, so our purpose of meeting with you tonight is to give you an update, to provide an overview of our safety practices, and to sort of make sure everyone's aware of all the personnel that we have um, involved in this in the county. Um, we are fortunate to have so much support and so many resources. We're also going to share some of the non-secure information for the general public. Um, as the board is aware, there are things that we do behind the scenes that we don't always publicize because we want to make sure that we have those procedures in place should we should we need them in a crisis. Um, and then we're also going to provide some updated results from the ongoing reviews that we do. So jumping in, oh, I haven't moved the slide, I'm sorry. There we go. The annual procedures, these are things that we are required to do every year. Um, and just to give you a, a just to look down the list, there are quite a few things. Um, we have school safety committees that meet monthly that are led by their school administrator. 
And um, we have our division safety committee that meets quarterly. We'll talk some more about that in a minute. Our school health advisory committee that includes community members, parents, um, and a lot, they, they advise us on both health, wellness, and anything related to safety. We have our crisis manual, which we update annually and actually as needed. Um, we recently updated, for example, with our tornado procedures because we realized that we had um, we just had some work to do with the way that the classrooms had to be reconfigured, so we updated that again. Um, we have our drills that we do, um, and they're listed there. Safety walkthroughs, um, we've done, we have a team that, that does the, the walkthroughs. Let's see, we've done three of the five schools in the last week, so uh, it's kind of a checklist that the Department of um, Criminal Justice Services gives us to use. We have a safety audit process that looks at everything related to safety. And um, first, the schools do a review of everything at the school level. And that is submitted by the end of December. And then we take that at the, to the division committee. And the division committee re reviews everything, adding in division data. And then that's submitted. Um, that will be part of the process that you'll see later this, uh, this school year and in, into the summer. And we use that to inform our process moving forward for the next school year. Um, we also have role-specific training, so we have a lot of teachers that, um, or staff members that participate in training, such as um, safety care, which is something to help with de-escalation in a, in a crisis with um, individuals who are escalating, and um, other things like that that are just very specific to the role. Um, the K-9 unit does safety sweeps. Um, we just had one last week at the high school. And um, we also participate in school climate surveys. We've done one so far this year at the high school, and we are about to do another one, grades 7 through 10, um, in partnership with the Rural Substance Abuse Awareness Coalition that will um, be able to use that data to help support any needs in that area. So as you can see, we've got a lot of things that we do annually um, or required to do, and then some things that we've added on. So we're going to give you an overview for the threat assessment process. The threat assessment process is something that came out of some of the tragedies um, that have happened across the country in um, school-related violence. And they found that in many cases, we were able to um, find that there was a predictable pattern, that they could see that the, in, the individual was on a pathway to violence. And so the, all of that research was um, combined and coalesced into a process that we in Virginia follow, and evidently it's, um, it leads the nation in this, in this area. Um, so basically, we initiate it whenever an individual poses a threat, and that means that, um, it doesn't mean that they're actually making a threat necessarily, but they pose a threat in some capacity. And so our administrators have all been trained, our school counselors have been trained. Um, it consists of um, an administrator, a counselor, an SRO, an instructional member, and then we pull in other people who are familiar with the student. In most cases, it is a student that we are um, initiating this process to to look at, but it could be a community member, it could be anybody who poses a threat. It is a research-based process, and it helps us to determine what it is that is the underlying issue, because ultimately what we want to do is resolve the issue and help the student to not only have consequences, but also to make a different choice moving forward um, so that we can ensure the safety of all students. And we do initiate that process, um, I think, you know, whenever there is a crisis or a, a a potential threat, um, and it happens regularly, and it's something that our staff members are, are briefed on. We've offered the training um, this summer. We have, I don't know, probably at least 10 people already signed up, teachers who would like more information that we're going to provide that training to. And then sometimes we have to respond to a crisis, and um, we're fortunate here. We have a lot of resources that are able to support our schools and our staff in this area. Um, we do have a division team, and there are lots of division staff that serve on that team, as well as our school counselors, our school psychologists, our SROs, and our school nurse. It really depends on what the nature of the crisis is um, as to which members would be helping to respond. Um, and some types of supports that we've had in the past have been, unfortunately, we've experienced the loss of a student, a, a staff member, community member. Um, we've had lockdowns where we've had to support the schools in processing that and um, notifying parents and community members. And we've um, experienced, the, oh, that's on there twice, the loss of a community member. So um, ultimately, all of the research and responding to crisis, um, obviously we do respond to the crisis as needed. But what we find is that it's much, um, 
more beneficial and creates the climate that if we are able to have a proactive response. So we're fortunate enough to be able to um, put some things in place that allow us to do this. And we believe in the layered approach. I know the board is familiar with the tiered systems of support, the VTSS model. And this is another aspect of that. So we have the tiered approach here as well. Um, all of the research says that relationships matter, that in many cases where people re resort to violence is because they felt that was their only alternative. They didn't have another voice. They didn't have another option. And so we've, um, we've worked really hard to put those relationships in place. And um, we have a climate that supports that. Our climate data does indicate that we are on track with this and that our students feel that they have somebody that they are connected to, that they can go to. In many cases, they're staff members, but um, we also have a lot of our students who go directly to our SROs in the school when they're feeling upset or concerned about something. So we've developed those relationships. Um, engagement as far as participation in clubs, participation in community activities, all of these things help to support students when they do face adversity and have some, um, something that they're upset about that they feel that they need to, um, to talk through. And so these um, areas, we're just gonna talk real briefly about what that looks like within our school division. Uh, it is a prevention model, so most of our efforts are gonna be spent at the prevention level because that's where most of our kids are. Um, and we do that through our PBIS framework. Um, we have our school-wide expectations in place that are taught at all of our schools, um, and we have the um, supports in place to how to recognize when students are demonstrating those expectations, and then we provide instruction when it's needed to help reteach those it, when students need more instruction in those areas. We've also done a lot with emotional wellness in the middle school and the high school, helping students to have some other strategies and to deal with stress and to deal with adversity. Um, because as we know, all of, us, all of us in the world are facing those things, but our teens in particular are having those issues to deal with. When we have to layer onto that, we layer onto our preventative approach, we do have some interventions that are required. So we have some students who require additional supports and it could be short term, it may be a longer term where we have a small, a small group that meets. Um, and those, it's really an instructional approach. So we are identifying an area where students have some kind of unmet need, some kind of concern, and we are providing the appropriate match for that. An example is right now at the high school, we have um, a group of students who've experienced a loss. And so one of our counselors is meeting with those students to provide them with some supports in the area of grief and dealing with grief. And you know, how does that feel when you're at school and you've got a lot of stress on you and you're still dealing with grief? Um, and so it, it, it varies depending on what the students need. Sometimes it's anger management. Sometimes it's, you know, as I mentioned, a grief group. And so we may um, include some supports like mentoring for those students who need it. We do goal setting and monitoring so the students know what their areas are that they're working to improve. And we give them feedback on those things so that they're able to make um, different choices moving forward if they have had some, some issues with um, following our school-wide expectations. And then we move into the area where very few t students will require this, but the intensive supports, the ongoing, long-term, individualized sorts of things that you may imagine that students need some help to help develop those connections with peers, to, to rely on their home supports and their community supports. So again, just helping that student to be connected within the community um, so that they are engaging in our school environment and feeling supported. So overall, all of these things um, are under our framework of prevention and interventions. We didn't want to give the message that we're not also um, having students have consequences because sometimes I, I, I worry that people are hearing that. Um, whenever a student does violate the code of conduct, they do have a consequence. And so we do have student discipline in choice choices that, we, um, that our, our administrators use, but it's proactive. We want to make sure that after the consequence, they also have an instructional piece that supports them so they have a different set of choices moving forward. Um, and our goal is so that they make a different choice in the future. Um, and so an example of that would be a behavior plan, incentives, or even a reentry plan for students who have experienced a suspension. We wanna make sure when they come back to school that something different happens, that whatever led them to make the choices they made um, that resulted in a suspension, that something different is in place for them to support them moving forward. 
So that's about how we establish the climate with the student and the instruction. And Mr. Tibbs is going to talk about the facilities. Thank you, Katie. From a facility standpoint, we have many things that are in place to ensure the security of our students and staff uh, all day long while they're in the building. All of our doors, our external doors, are self-closing doors with locking mechanisms. Any time that we are aware of this situation, whether a sheriff's department individual makes us aware of that or a staff member makes us aware of that through our school dude system, we immediately uh, focus on that. All of our entries, with the exception of Pocahontas Middle School, has, have buzz-in systems, and I'll talk about Pocahontas Middle School, what we've put in place there in just a minute. Our exterior lighting, we focus on this as well, especially with our schools having as many after-school events that we have. We ensure that all, all of our exterior lighting is, is sufficient. Um, if you recall, last spring, last summer, rather, uh, we spent a, a great deal of time and money ensuring that all of our perimeter lighting was up to par and, and all of our bulbs were replaced and et cetera. We have experienced some of that this, this spring and so we're ensuring that, that we get that taken care of. We have Knox boxes on all of our buildings. Each of our buildings has a Knox box on the outside of it. Inside that box is a key, a grandmaster key to the building as well as alarm code. This allows our fire, EMS, and sheriff's department to get into the buildings if the alarm systems uh, go off after hours, well after hours, after the custodial staff is gone, uh, and we've seen a lot of great success with that. In terms of traffic pat patterns, we ensure that our bus loops are clear and free at all times. We ensure that the traffic patterns are established there, as well as parent drop-off and pickup. Uh, we've established several different changes at some of the schools, uh, predominantly elementary schools, in regards to parent drop-off and pickup. Communication tools that we use, we use PA systems and walkie-talkies. All of the sheriff's department is connected to us through our walkie-talkie system. And so when we, when our school administrators communicate with each other through the walkie-talkie systems within the building, any of the sheriff's department individuals that are there, uh, SROs, they can hear what's going on in the building as well. Our fencing, we make sure that our fencing around our playgrounds and, and all of our buildings is uh, maintained. We have cameras in our buildings. Uh, most of uh, all the buildings have entry cameras and parking lot cameras um, and hallway cameras. And then the alarm systems, I mentioned that a few minutes ago with the Knox box. In terms of personnel. Excuse me, Dr. Tibbs, yes, can I, are we asking questions now? Much. Okay. Um, so go back to the cameras. So every school has cameras inside the building mm -hmm. and in the parking lots. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. They're not on the light poles in the parking lot, but we have some that are on the building that are panning the parking lots oh. and panning those areas. Okay. Well, I remember we talked last uh, month and we weren't sure that they were, but there are. Okay. Thank you. In terms of personnel that, that we go to or that um, are part of this safety committee, our director of student services and interventions, Mrs. Wojcicki, uh, myself, sorry. Uh, Director of Transportation and Disciplinary Hearing Officer, Mrs. Gwaltney. There's a designated administrator, as Mrs. Wojcicki just said a, a second ago, for safety at each school. The school psychologists and school counselors. We do have our watchdogs that are in our buildings, uh, elementary and middle school, from time to time, our school resource officers, and various community partners. And Mr. Wright. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about our school resource officer program. If you don't know, this is actually the, the 20th year of that program. And uh, Mr. Cole was very instrumental in getting um, that started. I know Ms. Ayers, you were on the board back then, so I know you all are quite familiar with it. So um, I wasn't the first SRO, but I was here when the program was started. And I'll tell you that uh, we had limited staffing back then, so uh, Sheriff Woodcock at the time impressed upon all of us the importance of that program. Um, and it's, I think it's a testament to the school and the Sheriff's Office that here we are 20 years later still in that partnership. Um, as far as our staff is concerned, uh, myself and uh, Deputy Connor and Deputy Kelly are the, the three current SROs. We've had more SROs in the past with, with less buildings to cover, um, and one day we hope to, to have more. Obviously, the school's budget and the sheriff's office budget are both kind of stretched, so uh, hopefully, un unfortunately with the issue with, with Parkland, but uh, hopefully there'll be some good that'll come out of it, maybe some federal or state funding that will allow us to 
um, expand that SRO program again and hopefully uh, get an SRO in every school at some point. That is ultimately the goal. Uh, as far as site security is concerned, the SROs uh, assist uh, with the regular staff members as far as um, checking doors, grounds, parking lots. Uh, we monitor uh, as well as uh, go back and search through camera footage for anything that may have occurred. Uh, we also work with the other staff members as far as checking visitors to make sure that they're uh, wearing their visitor badges where they're supposed to be and that they have a, a reason for being in our buildings. Um, we provide uh, extra security for uh, events, whether those events are during the school day or after the school day or even on the weekends. We're there for um, extra support and security. As far as uh, making connections in community policing, I think we do the same thing that all the other school staff members are doing. Um, we're fostering those relationships with the, the students as well as their families uh, to make sure that you know, they are going to, to come to us with the information uh, that they have that can help us with school safety um, as well as anything we can do to help the students to be more successful. Uh, cooperation with school administration, we're very lucky that uh, we all have an understanding that we all work under that umbrella of uh, confidential juvenile information. So um, we can share information um, back and forth anytime it has to do with a, uh, a student there again whether it be a safety issue or a student success issue you know we all understand that that information is protected and it's not going to uh, go outside either one of our agencies as far as instruction um, even though we've had the SRO program for 20 years Sheriff's Office has actually been teaching DARE for 30 years with Powhatan School System. Um, it won't be 30 consecutive years of teaching, but it's actually 30 consecutive graduating classes. So we uh, made a, a change a couple years ago when the, um, I guess the school structure changed, but the important thing is we will have hit 30 consecutive classes as far as uh, getting DARE to those. And currently Brett Connor is our, our DARE instructor at the sixth grade. And if you're familiar with DARE, it started on the West Coast back in the early 80s and um, kind of worked its way east. And it started as strictly a drug abuse resistance program. And over time, it's changed to um, actually promoting positive decision making, which is good because that is mirroring our life skills training that the kids are getting in the middle school as well as the PBIS that the division has. In regards to classroom lessons, in the past we've taught class action, we've taught Virginia rules. Um, these days we're mainly doing uh, classroom talks by request and we'll do that from any, any age group from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. We also assist with the driver education program. Uh, in regards to our law enforcement role, you know, school doesn't exist inside a bubble. So uh, like any community, sometimes that community experiences crime. Um, sometimes we have crime that comes in. Sometimes we generate our own that goes out. But um, our major role as far as uh, law enforcement is investigation of those crimes and making sure that uh, victims are treated fairly. Liaison role between uh, the school, the JPO, and the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Um, it's popular these days for, I guess, catchphrases like classrooms, not courtrooms, but that's something that uh, we've always done. We've always worked um, at the sheriff's office with the school division to make sure that we wanted the children to be successful. Um, whenever we could let school discipline handle a situation rather than getting them into the court system or juvenile justice system, we've always tried to do that. And finally, liaison with emergency services. Um, whenever an incident may arise, whether it be a, an injured student or a staff member or a need for additional resources, um, we're one of those people that's tasked with um, communicating with our communications center and getting uh, fire rescue or additional law enforcement services if needed. Mr. Chairman. Ms. Um Sergeant Wright. Yes, what does JPO stand for? Juvenile Probation Officer. Oh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
Are you familiar with the juvenile probation system? No. No, no which is good. I get, yeah, I think so, <laughs> but. Um, it, that's what it stands for, but I don't want to give you a misrepresentation of what it actually is. The JPO is a, basically a third parent that you don't know your kids have until they get in trouble. They, by statute, have the same authority over your child as you do. And they, but they work for the state. Um, so we can take, the JPO system is set up to deter kids from having to go to court. Um, JPO is a magistrate in function. So when um, a juvenile commits a crime, <clears throat> they don't necessarily go see the adult magistrate. They go see the juvenile magistrate. Juvenile magistrate decides whether she would like it to go to court or whether, and I say she because their current um, is she, um, whether she would go to take it to court or whether she will do a diversion, which is she'll set punishment and set the uh, restrictions herself without putting it into court. So that therefore there's not a court, there's not a criminal history created for your child. Uh, the JPO has the authority to do anything that you could do with your child. Um, so if she decides that the disciplinary program needs to be that your child is reading this book at 10 o'clock at night, every night, then she can send us over there to make sure that your child is reading this book at 10 o'clock that night or she's in violation. And she may decide then to take them to the court to the next level. So a lot of people aren't aware that that person even exists. But there's this position out there just for juveniles. And that's to deter the pipeline, you know, this prison, kids getting criminal records, things that we don't want to see except in the last resorts. So we have a buffer, which is a JPO officer, and she works closely with our office. No. Thank you. you So as you can see, we have a lot of support um, and we work with our um, SROs and with the Sheriff's Department and with other community agencies to support our students. Additionally, we've looked at our uh, needs within the division as far as making sure that we have the supports within the school building. And so um, there has been discussion about having some additional administrative support at PMS and PHS. And so um, we're looking on ways to do that. Um, such as having administrative aides or offering some support to teachers who are working toward administrative endorsements. Um, we also look at additional supervision for um, additional supports for supervision during the day and at extracurricular events. And we're benefiting from that because we're providing our own future leaders with that support and that on the job training that is so valuable as they move um, into consideration for administrative positions. We also, as um, Sergeant Wright mentioned, are continuing to advocate for additional SRO positions in the budget cycle as it becomes um, feasible. And so throughout this year, in, in particular, every year we go through an analysis and we work with our community partners to see where our unmet needs and where we have um, possibilities for improvement. And so this year was no different, but I do feel that this year has been much more visceral. People are very um, concern with what they're seeing in the news as we all are and so we have gotten a lot of community um, questions about it and so these are just some things that we've done this school year and and as I mentioned this is not necessarily a different amount of in initiatives for us for this school year but it is something um, as a you know that we wanted to highlight so we've updated our visitor check-in policy. Um, we actually put that in place at the beginning of the school year and then due to some software type issues, we've been tweaking it all year long as we go. But just you may notice a difference when you visit the schools that we are requiring people to scan their driver's license and to come in and have that check-in every time they visit. Um, we do, we have, as um, Mr. Tibbs, Dr. Tibbs mentioned, we are um, updating our drop-off and pick-up procedures. And did you want to talk more about that? or? Okay, um, the doors at PMS, I'm gonna let him fill you in on that. And then we've added the watchdog program at the middle school, we've had a really good um, turnout with that. And um, we continue to review procedures with all staff. And we do that annually, but again, as staff have had concerns, we have updated them as well. For the doors at the middle school, um, as you know, I mentioned a minute ago, we don't have a buzz-in system there and being as we're gonna close that building in June, we really didn't see where it was fiscally responsible to even explore that option. So what we have done is we partnered with transportation and we have two bus drivers who are willing to come in and work during the day in between their runs. And they are at a location at a station right at that front door 
And so anyone that comes up to the door has to be let into the building. So the front door of the middle school is locked at all times. Um, when the bus drivers are, are running their routes, one of them runs a double route. Uh, Dr. Martin pulls the library aide and, and any additional staff member that, that's available to man that station. So that station is manned from the time the students are in the building until the end of the day when students leave every day. And then the additional school zone signals, if you'll recall during our uh, construction facilities updates over the past several months, we have updated those throughout the year. Um, all the ones on Route 60 have been updated. They have wireless technology. Batterson Road, Jutes Ferry Road has been updated as well. Uh, we do have new ones for Route 13, although I'm holding off a little bit because there's still a lot of construction that still needs to go down Route 13, and I don't want to, those items to get damaged, um, so we're going to hold off on those, but they will be installed prior to next school year. Can we Continuing and what we've done this year. Um, we've also expanded our division safety team, so we're able to have some more community members who were able to join us this year. Um, so currently our safety team includes not just school staff and members from each uh, school, Sergeant Wright, we have a representative from our Department of Social Services, a representative from, sorry, I'm just blanking on that, from the fire department, and also um, Kurt Nellis, who is our community, I'm gonna blank on his, emergency management thank you emergency <laughs> management person um, and so that's been really helpful to have uh, a lot of different voices who can inform us and help us to support our students and our staff um, we've mentioned the increased emphasis on door security throughout the school day and for example at the middle school that staff there now is keeping they're keeping the classroom doors locked because of it is a campus style school it's it's really difficult to keep all of the exterior doors between the breezeways and so forth locked although we do have staff members who are uh, who are keeping an eye on those doors we just now have added the additional precaution of having the classroom doors locked we've added the safety debriefs and tabletop trainings this year um, that's something that it was the administrators at each school um, the full team their counselors their special education leads um, school psychologists and we all just sat down and talked about the safety things that have happened at the schools and that we've learned from other schools and other places around the country. And we did some tabletop activities, sort of um, just additional training for our staff to sort of process how would you handle this? What would you do if? Um, we've had student behavioral assessments that we've added as another way in addition to working with, um, when we have a student who has a, something that's impacting them behaviorally, we have now a more formalized procedure on how to analyze their behavior and really um, meaningfully put some supports in place. And um, the middle school recently hosted an internet safety forum as well. Um, so again, we're continuing to look at areas where we've gotten feedback or where we have a lot of questions or concerns. Um, we have received other suggestions from community members as far as products or things that we can look into, and we do look at them. We take them back to our um, safety committees and we get feedback. Um, and so, you know, some things that seem feasible may not really work when you think about it from a fire code perspective, or for example. So we've had to look at things um, cohesively that we can put in place, and we, we are considering everything that comes to us as a possible suggestion. Um, and then, oh, I don't know what's happening there. Okay, identity. <laughs> That's just the, the procedure that we use at the school for, um, for the screening. So I just wanted to highlight that because that is a different thing when people see it. It will provide you with an official badge. We do ask every visitor to wear their badge and not lose their badge because when they check out, there's a code on the badge that they will enter to check themselves out. The reason for that is it allows us to account for who's in our building. So if we ever did have to evacuate, um, we would know who's there. And um, that's something that um, we weren't really able to do before because it is web-based we can we can access it it also uses some online um, checklists that allow us to screen our visitors as well so provides that additional level of security so we did support we did list some resources here for you and for community members who are interested um, and we're happy to um, answer any questions that you might have I just wanted to say thank you to um, Sheriff Nunley and Sergeant Wright for partnering with us on this because Dr. Chiz and I doing this alone would, would just not present the full picture. 
Thank you. All right, thank you. But before we have questions from the board, if Sheriff Donnelly would like to make any remarks, certainly want to give you that oh, opportunity, oh, yeah, sir. I could do that and before, but I before you begin, let me thank you on behalf of the board for you taking the time out of your mm -hmm. schedule to be here with us this evening. We do sincerely appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate sure. the inv invitation. Um, I, I, there's a couple things I wanted to bring up. Um, we did have the canines go through the schools the other day. Um, it, staff was not notified prior, students not notified prior. It's a program we've had in place for years. Um, and the good news is that um, we only had two hits and two backpacks. Um, one was easily explainable, there was no offense connected with it, and the other one was still investigating, but there was no illicit product or anything dangerous on the property. So that's good news. High schools should be commended for that. Um, uh, we all hear the, the rumors and sometimes their kids come home and after talking to some of them, you would think that they can't get from class to the bathroom without drugs falling out of everybody's pockets. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is when we, the proof's in the pudding. When we run, we run six to eight canine units through there and bomb sniffing dogs all at one time, we are not making mass arrests at the high school, okay? Um, they're not, the narcotics are not being detected. These are the same drug dogs that uh, we've used to seize uh, in the last two weeks over $5,000 in cash, uh, quite a bit of narcotics, heroin, um, things on our roadways, and some firearms. So they're trained. It, it, they didn't mess up and miss them. Um, you know, it, so it's good, to, it's good to know that the programs are working. Are there going to be drugs in our schools at times? Yes, there are. Nobody's burying their head in their sand and believing that They've never come into the school. Um, all of us at some time or another went to high school, and some of us longer ago than others. Um, so we do remember that, that there are always going to be any large group of people there is going to be um, some drugs there. But I do want to commend the high school for the job they're doing, along with our SROs, with keeping it as minimum, as, as minimum levels as we can. And uh, I just want to make sure the board was aware that we were in there. And, it went real well, so thank you. And the other is, Dr. Jones and I have been meeting here regularly and we're working on some programs. Um, obviously, there's always new staff coming in, uh, sheriff's office, new staff coming into schools and getting everybody up to the same um, page and, and up to speed with policies and procedures. Uh, Dr. Jones and I have tweaked some of them together um, and we're getting to a, a good level of communication between us and uh, it's always a work in progress, um, but it's going well and th those lines of communication are open and it's um, opportunities for us to improve our program and the schools to um, improve their security. And uh, one of the things is gonna be hopefully getting more SRO officers in the future. Um, and I'm recently uh, gonna be appointed to a, a regional directorship with the uh, Virginia Sheriff's Association. So we're hoping to go to them and uh, speak with the comp board about relieving some of the local burden um, through the comp board um, funding, which is gonna be important. So that's gonna be high on our list this year of things to talk about. So just some news and updates on what's going on. No, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank sure, you. sure if, I, if I could, let me just congratulate you on what I understand to be the 20th year of our school resource officer program here in the county. Um, I did want to say this, and one of the things that, that we had talked about at a previous meeting, uh, we wanted the opportunity to thank you publicly for the work of your officers in our schools. Do a fantastic job. They're a tremendous resource for our students and our staff, and we appreciate your support in letting them be there and, and performing those very important roles. Yes, so sir. thank you for that, sir. It's money well spent, so thank you. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. All right, so at this point, if the board uh, has questions for any of the uh, presenters or the sheriff or Dr. Jones. Ms. Emil? Um, Mrs. Wojcicki, if we could go back to um, slide 15 with the uh, personnel. So right now, we don't have the administrative aides at each school, and that's something we want to have. Is that yeah, um, it is, it's one of the um, strategies we've talked about. Uh, we don't currently have administrative aides in our buildings. It's a program that um, several divisions that um, border us have. Um, it has the dual benefit of um, providing extra supervision and support because you identify uh, aspiring administrators um, during their planning or their duty period. They 
become administrators in training. They work within the system principal, they're out in the hallways, they're supervising lunch duty, before school they're doing bus duty, after school they're helping out with extracurricular events, and they're learning on the job. So that's the second benefit is it uh, helps us identify people who are gonna be good future administrators and uh, gives them some training and most of those administrative programs, they have to have a certain number of internship hours. It allows them to knock out some of that as well. So um, that's something that uh, would be a minimal cost to, to provide um, two administrative aides at each building would be about $8,000 um, in stipends for the year. Uh, so that is something that we could certainly look at doing. I've talked to both Dr. Massa and uh, Dr. Martin. They're both enthusiastic about that. Mm -hmm. uh, feel like it would serve both purposes mm -hmm. of um, identifying future talent, but also providing some extra um, supervision during the day and after school. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one strategy that we've looked at and could kind of be an intermediary before we look at um, possibly putting in additional full-time staff uh, mm -hmm. at the administrative level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I, I was thinking they were office people or whatever. I, I like that idea. I think that's that's really a good idea. I'd like to see us implement that this, this coming year if we could. Um, okay, my next question was um, uh, the Pocahontas Elementary School, I guess this would be for everybody. Um, I get a lot of parents who are not happy with the entrance to that and we all understand that that school is older and that's how it was built but um, I would really like us to get a full-time person at that window entrance um, starting next year as a full-time um, uh, job because it's just as one parent called and told me she said you know I can just come in anyone could come in and go down that first hallway with all those classes and I guess I shouldn't be saying all of it, but <laughs> my point being that yep. it's, not, it's not secure because, right. you know, offices do get busy, yep. at, and it's not their fault. Um, you know, we, I, I don't want us putting so much on our school staff when right. we can be helping uh, them with more personnel for security yep. reasons. And that's a conversation that uh, Ms. Wojcicki and I had Monday, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> okay. um, so we talked exactly about that. Um, and I think with us adding additional students to Pocahontas Elementary next year, um, we could look at making that attendance person that mans that desk right by the door mm -hmm. full time um, because we would be taking away from some other schools and we have some part time people and we may be able to reduce hours so that it's a budget neutral item mm -hmm. um, to increase the time there because of the um, additional students that are there and also the safety concerns. So yeah. we still need to um, crunch the numbers a little bit to see if that could be done, um, but, um, but it is something that we've talked about. Um, it's come up at their safety committee meetings at Pocahontas Elementary, mm -hmm. uh, and it is a, just a factor of how that building was designed and exactly. the decision to put the office there instead mm -hmm. of where it should have been, which is in the art room. Um, mm -hmm. But I digress, and that's we can't go back in time right. and change that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's something certainly that we've taken a look at. We also talked about looking at some other safety features of that first hallway that you mentioned, mm -hmm. of locking those doors from the outside. Oh, that's um, a so great that idea. somebody yeah. can't just go into them. Right, right. Um, people could come out of that hallway right. when they're going to resource. If uh -huh. there's a teacher there, they would have a key. And mm -hmm. if a student needs to go to the office, there's a back way they could go into the office without coming into that mm -hmm. front hallway that provides greater exposure to the public. So mm -hmm. we're going to take a look at some different um, strategies to kind of minimize that, um, that design flaw. Okay. Good, because I, I, I remember talking about this uh, as a parent um, after the Sandy Hook shootings mm -hmm. and um, saying that that needed to be done and it still isn't done. So yeah. I, I really would like to see that done for this coming year. Um, I also had another um, uh, citizen who um, said, um, what about um, the metal detectors? Um, or, and adding police or qualified volunteers to station at the metal detectors, um, and I quote here, ask someone who opposes the cost to implement metal detectors to the cost of the life of just one child. Uh, so that was their um, feeling, and I didn't know um, how everybody else felt about that, but I am sharing this with you sure. because this was a concern of a citizen. And I think uh, Sheriff Nunnally and I um, had a conversation about metal detectors. I think there's some logistical issues of um, 
of how you get students in and out of a building with a metal detector, um, you know, before school, after school, and, and during times when there's a lot of movement. I think we both feel, and the sheriff not only can jump in, that we're not there yet in terms of a safety. Um, you know, there are some urban schools that are exposed to a um, greater number of households and, and more crime that do have some um, metal detectors, but I think in Powhatan, I, my feeling is is we don't want to turn our schools into prisons. Uh, we don't want them to, uh, you can go, you can be safe, but at the same time you want to have a welcoming um, environment and climate for your school. Um, and I think that sometimes um, we just need to balance that. So um, I don't know if Sheriff Nunley, you have anything well, you want to add? I, yeah, I would um, concur with a lot of that, but um, primarily right now we, we haven't had a crime rate or an incident rate at the schools to necessarily justify the uh, additional use of the uh, metal detectors. Um, they, they are very expensive. Uh, they, they do require trained operators, and um, we haven't reached that level yet. Um, I don't, we never want to reach that level, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. But, um, if we saw the incidences in school, the, the minor incidences, um, we're not sitting around waiting for a shooting before we get metal detectors. That's not what anybody's saying. But some of the clues that lead up to these larger problems or the smaller problems we'll see of somebody carrying knives to school, somebody carrying uh, drugs being in school, because um, a lot of these, these fights and these incidents are over illegal activity, things like that. And so if we, if we start seeing an upturn in those type of activities, it would be a discussion we'd be more open to right away than to say next year. Um, so we don't we don't have that rate of incidents at the uh, schools yet, um, nor in our community right now to, uh, in my opinion, justify it yet. Um, we're able to, if we're suspicious of someone, we the school has all the authority they need to pull them to the side and search them. They they can set up a safety plan with that child, and the SROs will participate in. So if we have that person on the radar, we have place, things in place to deal with that now. Yeah, so. Well, thank you. I will relay your uh, response. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Um, my next question was the uh, new middle school. Um, what are we doing, you know, what's included with our, our building, um, our, um, our 40 million plus dollars. Do right. we get cameras? Do we get, yeah. what do we get with that? There's full coverage within the school. Um, I don't know if Jason knows off the top of his head how many cameras there are, but there's a whole bunch. Um, over 80. Yeah, and outside the school, um, the board will remember when we toured that, there is a vestibule, a security vestibule that requires everybody to enter the main office, um, similar uh, to what we have at Flat Rock Elementary, so that'll be part of it. Um, we also did a lot of things in response to, in, in terms of designing it. The reason the bus loop is in the back of the school is because it doesn't provide as much coverage on Route 13. So when you're loading and unloading buses, it'll be behind the school where there's not ready access to, to 13 and 60. So um, I think that whole school was designed with safety in mind. Um, and I think we've taken a lot of precautions. There's gonna be card readers. One of the things that came up at um, the teacher advisory committee yesterday was um, a teacher, and I can't remember the school off the top of my head, I think it may have been Pocahontas Elementary, said, you know, there's some doors that people are going in and out of, and instead of having to worry about keys, it'd be nice to have a card reader because then if somebody is um, no longer working for us or you want to provide access to just part of the building or only during certain hours like the YMCA when they're there using the schools for basketball, you can program that into those cards. And that is Corporations something- Corporations have. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we're gonna have at Powhatan Middle School for a lot of the exterior doors that have heavy traffic. So that's another added layer of security. Good, I'm really glad to know that we're being proactive and, and these things have been decided beforehand. Thank you, uh, that, that's, because uh, I know those questions will be coming. Yes. Um, Ms. Liam, could I ask you to yes. yield just a minute? Let me ask sure, a follow-up sure. question to that. Mm -hmm. So you, you spoke about the new building, and, and it sounds like we're in excellent shape with the new building. So with our older buildings that are currently in use, do we have routine assessments done on those? That, you know, uh, one of the groups is the Crime Prevention through Envi Environmental Design, the SEPTED assessments. Do we have those routinely done? I know Sheriff Nunnally yes. and his staff are well aware of that program and what that's about. Yes. 
we have them routinely done for that by that group. We also have them routinely checked by uh, CSI, which is okay. communication specialist. They, right. matter of fact, during spring break, they came in and tested all of our audibles for our fire system and, and our strobe lights and everything for the fire system. And then Richmond Alarm comes in and every year and does an analysis of our touch points for the burglar alarm system as well uh, to make sure that all of those contacts on the doors are working appropriately and, and all of that. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you, Ms. Amy. Sure. Sure. Anybody else needs to uh, come in why when I'm asking. Why, why I've got, don't you go ahead and finish? And I've got, you know, believe me, I got a lot of questions. This is a real, a real concern. It's been um, not just since Parkland, but you know, for several years. So I really am appreciative of all of you for um, doing all this good work. Um, I guess uh, a couple other things: um, increased emphasis on door security throughout the school day. I know one day I went to Pocahontas Elementary and. Um, I, I don't know if it was for the spelling bee or what it was, but anyway, um, there was a woman ahead of me who had already buzzed in, and she was, they were letting her in, and then there was me coming, and then there was another woman coming from the um, Maiden's Cafe to deliver, and um, that's kind of scary because the people that are buzzing in can't, you know, uh, know what's going on. Well, I, I did step in and I said, Hi, you know, it's me, you know, Kim email, and then oh, here's um, so-and-so from Maiden's Cafe. But how do we, you know, having more than, um, prevent more than one person doing that and we don't know who they are. In another incident last summer, I took my daughter to the high school for um, summer camp, one of the camps, and I went to pick her up, and of course I went through the main door and went around to get her like I was supposed to, and at the other side, I guess that's where the buses come, there was a, a parent, I guess, I should say there was a woman going like this, like, let me in. And, you know, I'm like, I don't know who she is, and I know she did, and she, did, she let me know, but I just went like this, like, you know, you need to go around. Well, it turned out her daughter was in the same camp my daughter was, and you know, but I just, I, I feel so strongly that I didn't know her. Now, maybe if I did know her, I, this still is not the right thing to let her in. So that's another couple things I'm concerned about. <laughs> and, and we have considered that within our safety meetings, and that's something that, again, we're, we're training ourselves and training our students and training, and we're, we're building a culture within the community where we're asking people to, um, the first step was bring your driver's license when you're coming in to scan into a school. And so we've had to, you know, sort of get people used to that. We had a lot of pushback, and we had a lot of parents say thank you. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it depends on the, the person's perspective. Um, if you're carrying a lot of things and you can't reach the buzzer, I'm sure you're unhappy when someone doesn't automatically open the door for you. However, I think when people take a step back and think from a safety perspective, they understand why we're doing these things. Um, but we have, we have discussions about how can we begin to communicate to everybody who's visiting our schools that we're not gonna open the door, we do need you to buzz in, you know. Um, more than one person coming in at a time is something we're just gonna have to work through, but just know that on the other end of that buzzer there's a camera and people are aware. And so oftentimes um, someone will step out into the hallway and say, oh, can I help you? Because they realize that two people might have come in with one person having pushed the buzzer. So these are things we're continuously working on. Um, and, and we are getting a lot of feedback on it from both staff, students, and community members. OK, thank you. And um, I, I want to say the, um, I did attend the VSBA safety seminar, um, webinar. And it, it did show what you are saying and what we are doing about um, the emphasis on prevention being the best, um, well, rather than uh, going crazy. But on the same hand, um, and I appreciate that, did, did you both attend that? or Yes, uh, actually we all did. Oh, so we were very fortunate to be able to do this that. Year. Great, and I, I was just really pleased with how many things that we were already doing. That was good. Um, but I am, as a, as a school board member, I am going to advocate for um, additional SROs in the schools, and I would like to see it this fall, along with uh, the desk, uh, the person at Pocahontas Elementary um, full-time, and um, was there one more? Sheriff, would you like to respond to that 
question or statement? Well, I, I'm in agreement. <laughs> oh, whether I would like to see uh, more SROs as quickly as we can also. Um, Dr. Jones and I are discussing some areas, of some stop gaps maybe, if you want to call them that. Um, we're going to have to obviously go to the Board of Supervisors mm -hmm. uh, for additional funding um, and, you know, the difficulties in, in the budgets. We all know that very well. Uh, but we're we're trying to figure out other ways to get through this year um, so that we can create uh, the I guess support for more SROs out there. Um, I don't think anybody in the public at, at this time is in uh, opposition of having more SROs, um, and we certainly are not. Uh, and there's some other ideas that are being floated out there in the public that may not be suitable for our school system. Uh, but if we had uh, volunteers, and I'm talking unarmed volunteers, but I'm talking about volunteers, um, that's something that the school could look at uh, with their criteria. Um, having having eyes on the problem is, is important, and so there there are a lot of areas we can go to make up the difference in the, the number of SROs we have now. But um, I'm I'm in agreement with you. I'd like to have them as quickly as I can get them in there. Um, but I will tell you, three SROs are first year cost two hundred thousand dollars. And I can appreciate that. I just think that we um, the other ideas of having other people with um, guns, I, I j personnel. I, I like the idea better of a trained officer, sheriff, deputy of yours in the building with with a gun if necessary rather than other people yeah, yeah I prefer and, that option yeah. so yeah um, so I would like to I would like us to put this on the agenda for our next uh, uh, meeting combined meeting with the uh, Board of Supervisors and thank you all very much I appreciate all your work today that you've explained to me thank you all right thank you Ms. Eagle. any other questions for any of the presenters Mr. Mr. Chairman, if, if we might uh, Mr. Dickey and, and, and the Sheriff's Department both emphasize the importance of relationships mm -hmm. in preventing uh, preventing problems and violence in particular. And, you know, the PBIS is there and some other things you have in, in place are there also. But as we look back, or as least as I look back on some of the recent school events, there obviously was a a breakdown and, and, and recognizing somebody and some who, who potentially could have caused a problem and, and intervening with that person um, and, and I'm hopeful that we have in place some some procedures for making sure that we do follow up with those people and that you know that that we are working to build relationships somebody's working to try to build relationships with those people that we identify as possibly being potentially a problem down the road in terms of their the way they get along with folks in the building or the way that, or the way they're dealing with issues in their lives um, so uh, just that's just a comment and it's not you don't need to make a response to that at this point but it's just my, one of my concerns and the other concern is that I, I know we do threat assessments and we either determine that it's a threat or we determine it's not a threat and and I guess my question would be when we determine it's not a threat but it at some level, there still is some concern. Are we still following up with that student? Is there an intermediate, you know, between, you know, he's not a threat, but we are heightened alert with this young young person? Yes, actually, um, I'll kind of combine your two questions because they're very related. For any of our students in Powhatan, we have such a great climate that if we have a child with two office referrals, they're an outlier. Um, and so we have started a procedure where our administration is, is actively case managing students and it's not necessarily just office referrals there could be other issues that we're aware of through you know um, interactions with school counseling through interactions with teachers that we become aware that we have concerns about students and um, so we start to actively case manage which means that an administrator is checking in with that student about that student they're checking in with their um, with their staff member with the students teachers they're you know they're just following through 
Um, in many cases, that also includes some sort of behavioral planning. Doesn't know it's you know we think about behavior plans as if you do this you get that, but that's not really what I mean. It's more about planning things, um, supporting them. What what will it look like if the student is experiencing anger? Let's say about you know which may be something that they do often. They have a safe space. They have they know what they can do. We have de-escalation strategies. We have we have identified that work well for that student. Um, but generally, what we're trying to do is always keep communication open with the student with their family so that we can so we know what they're thinking and we can help. Support Support them doesn't mean that they can always do what they want to do or that they're going to get the things that they might be angry about but they understand that there is a place they can go and people they can talk to to have that communication and um, even when students have been disciplined and who are um, unable to attend school maybe because they're they're suspended or um, they're on a long-term suspension we make the effort um, with Mrs. Gwaltney's support to try and continue to maintain that relationship. We're reaching out to parents. We're reaching out to students. Um, we've been fortunate enough to be able to provide educational services for every student that's not attending school right now. We have somebody checking in with them because we know, um, and it was reinforced through the um, webinar that Mrs. Emil mentioned, that it's about relationships. And the, the times when people resort to that violence is when they don't have another alternative. And, and um, if a student feels that they have people they care about within the building, they're less likely to re resort to violence. Mm -hmm. You know, so to answer your question, yes, we are following up on all of the I, students. I appreciate that because I, you know, I did not have that information that you were doing that. That does make me feel a lot better. But, and just a comment, having been around schools over the last several years and, and seeing where we are in safety now compared with where we were not too very long ago, and, 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 it, and Sergeant Wright alluded to our first SROs, and it was a much, much different environment in those days than now. I, I, I want to commend everybody for what they've done and, and their, uh, their attention to what we're doing with safety, but I also want to caution people that safety, school safety, is, and safety in general is a work in progress, and, 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 you, and we have a lot of things in place to monitor that work in progress, um, but you know we'll never get there. We'll always be aspiring to get there, and, and I think you know Sheriff Nunley has alluded to the budget piece of it, and, and, and from an educational perspective, Dr. Jones said you know we, we want to make sure that we're welcoming an environment. It is a balance. You know, schools' missions primarily is about education, and, and obviously educating students about how to get along with each other and and, and peaceful ways to deal with each other is an important part of that but you know I think we we're you know we're doing a pretty good job striking a balance right now and and you know we can always do more but the question is is it reasonable to do more and and so I do appreciate what you're doing and I appreciate your efforts to monitor it and like I said I I see it as a work in progress and, and as long as we're making progress and we continue to adjust to what we see out there I, I, I do does give me some cause for, for, for uh, feeling better about where we are. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Cole. Any other questions? All right, I try to save mine until the end, and I'm just going to ask you a couple. And I, and I will tell you, I, I do recognize that you've been at the podium now for quite a while, so <laughs> I will try to be brief. Um, first, let, let me ask, you, you did talk about some training that you do, tabletop exercises and other things, and this is really for, for any of you, including Dr. Jones. But when, when we do those exercises, tabletop exercises are great, but we do, do we do practical exercises as well? When the law enforcement, public safety first responders are engaged in those exercises, or our staff as well, you, you, will, you will act and conduct yourself in a crisis the way that you train, and how do we do that? How do we do that? Yes, I'll jump in and then anybody else feel free to. We do have drills and we have proce procedural things that we actually are doing in get involving students, involving um, staff to right. actually practice. Um, but some things we just, you know, we have to problem solve around what would, what would we do if, but mm -hmm. we don't want to create a climate where we're, our kids are starting to feel alarmed if we're doing multiple mm -hmm. drills and multiple um, scenarios. So what we've done is um, involved our staff and our administration in particular in um, developing some of those scenarios that we can talk through. What would that look like? How would we have to change what we've trained on in order to accommodate um, the situation? And, and a simple example is we've, we do fire drills, a lot of fire drills. 
what if the fire um, route that we're used to is blocked? You know, so that's like an, an, an example. I don't want to get too detailed, but we, we mm -hmm. take that and apply it to other scenarios as well that schools have faced um, across the country. And then we are providing, um, we actually have a, we had a meeting just last Friday where we talked about some um, specific training that we're going to be offering for staff starting with the high school um, in a couple of weeks that we're going to do some more of that with the whole faculty on what would it, how would a response occur in the event of a crisis, what would it look like, and um, Sergeant Wright is going to be the one to deliver that. Did you want to add yeah, anything? I can speak to it. Yeah, we we don't want to create an environment where our, our staff are, are scared to come to work because they think something's going to happen you know, every time they walk in the door. But um, in recognizing what's happening, obviously, we want, we want to prepare them as much as we possibly can. So yeah, we've been working on um, coming up with something that we're actually going to, I guess, pilot at the uh, high school's next faculty meeting. And, um, you know, without obviously creating a critical incident there to, to train through, but um, help them understand what, what's going to happen in those moments after a critical incident. You know, who's, who's going to be coming? What are we going to be doing? Um, just so they can kind of see it in, uh, in their minds and kind of understand, you know, that, uh, you know, help is coming. Um, I don't know. I'll just leave it at that for right now. I think that's, that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. The next question I have is, is simply, so sure, if you talked about an, a cost associated with some additional school resource officers, what, what would you like to see in terms of school resource officers? I would eventually like to see, we, ha we are going to have five schools. I'd like to see six resource officers. Um, we have three now in place. Um, we had some retirements and some other things. Um, we want to, we would like to see the every, I'd like to see every school, including the elementary schools, have a resource officer in place. And the reason we need six is every, anybody doesn't, any business knows that somebody's always sick, somebody's always on vacation, somebody's always at training. Uh, so it gives us the ability for the uh, administrator of that division to not only go check on each school and, and to supervise the work of the, the men under him, men and women under him, but it also allows him to have a school staff when somebody's out. Um, so so um, allowing him to be able to supervise is what I want. I, uh, Tim and I uh, were teaching active shooter back before they called it that. So we have a, a history. Uh, we've taught for 26 agencies um, together over the years, and um, it's good. He's in a good role. Um, right now for our office and for the school. So uh, his background, but I need people for him to supervise. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, first year costs are higher because uh, there's a car associated. Uh, the, the bulletproof vests we wear, they're $500 a piece. Um, you know, this is the most expensive clothes I own <laughs> right here. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife will tell you. Um, this uniform uh, gun belt and um, bulletproof vests and shoes it is a thousand dollar outfit um so it um it, it costs money um nobody wants the, look public safety is always expensive um our children are expensive their safety is expensive we, we'll need to find ways to pay for it nobody is suggesting that since it's expensive we shouldn't do it and i've never gotten that from the school or or our staff um but we have to be conscious of it and it is approximately $200,000 cost to outfit three, v three units that first year. Your insurance, your, your uh, pay, your, the car they drive, the uniform they wear, and the training we have to send them to. Uh, it'll go down significantly after the first year. Uh, so uh, that's where we are. I, I, I believe that's the magic number. Uh, just as an aside, that, I don't know necessarily which teachers and staff is representing which elementary schools here tonight, but I can assure you that if I put one full-time SRO at one elementary school and not two others, that I'm gonna hear about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and rightfully so. So um, that, that's where I'm at. That's my magic number right now is I, I need three. All right. Three more. Three more. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Six in total. And we've, we've got to figure out a way mm -hmm. together to make it happen. So we'll put that on the agenda. All right, other questions for the sheriff? I do just have a, a couple Sayers. of quick questions. Um, as a result of the last 
school shooting that happened, I know that I'd seen several programs about classroom safety zones where, you know, within the classroom there's a place where kids could go that they, if someone did come in, that they wouldn't immediately be, you know, whether it's a closet or behind a bookcase or is that something that we're also looking at, individual classroom safety zones? With the, with the training um, of what part of the classroom is the safest part to be in, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we, we have been. Um, what I've been involved in over this last year, or, or the end of last year and the first of this year, has been doing a lot of church safety, um, which correlates to what we do in the schools. Um, and there, there, there is a, a lot of... Um, You've got to have acceptance into the, the you want know the churches, explain to the churches what, what every, every adult that we put in with your kids at a church, what's the one thing that gets done? It's a background check, right? It's so common nobody thinks about it anymore. Fifteen years ago when we started doing that, the churches pushed back and so did some of the parishioners. Why do I need to have a background check on a man that I've been going to church with 20 years? But now it's common, right? Well, 20 years ago, we weren't train, chain, training churches on what to do with active shooters either. So these things that we're putting in place, the biggest resistance we have from the churches, from the parishioners, locking doors. If you've got a door that you like to use and it happens to go through the kitchen before you get up to the hall, you don't want to stop using it. That, that <laughs> something that silly is the biggest um, thing that the pastors are telling me they have to fight with their congregation about is which doors they're going to lock now. And, uh, and we're going to go through it with the schools also. Um, so, But we are making headway there. Okay. And the only other thing that I wanted to ask, and I know I'm not really even sure how you prevent it from happening other than when you're on lockdown, nobody, I mean, I was at one of the schools <laughs> trying to get in for a fire, during a fire drill and they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> like, yep. we're having good life, we're in lockdown, you're not coming in. I was like, oh. Okay, yeah. bye. Yeah, yeah if you're um, not wearing a badge, so, then you're not yeah. coming in. And, and that's fine. I mean, I was really impressed, yeah. actually, yeah. that just during a fire drill that I wasn't allowed in the building. I was like, that's great. That's fine with me. But that was something else that I heard, that parents rushed the buildings. And yes. now with communication the way it is with our kids, I mean, you could easily have hundreds of parents mm -hmm. at a school within a couple of minutes, and they're going to be probably they running are. in the building. And we train air people how to deal with it. When I get more of our resources on there, your, her people are being trained how to deal with those issues, and they're going to have parents are going to panic. It's their kids. Dr. Jones and I have dealt with this on the phone many times. We've, we've made up our minds to send out notices to parents, um, knowing full well that it's going to be a phone nightmare uh, but we accept that it's part of the job it's part of the culture it's going to change as, as parents get more and more used to this unfortunately new normal that we live in um, but I would rather have a bunch of panicked parents coming up than risk the chance of not taking the right action so mm -hmm. we'll we'll deal with them as they they come up and We'll get hurt feelings and we'll make up later. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but we're going to take care of the kids first. All right. Know? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right. I, I would just make one final comment. I, I got a lot of questions after the most recent tragic school shooting, and they all were essentially the same. Have, have we done everything we should do to keep our students safe? And, and I will say that I feel very good answering the question after listening to the presentation tonight. Sure, if I thought you were very clear in what you felt like you needed moving forward, and uh, as an individual board member, I certainly will support you in that effort. So, all right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jones. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, next item is a uh, information um, on outsourcing school food service department. Um, it's a topic that we've discussed many times over the last couple years. Um, and the process is coming to a close, and uh, Mr. Johns is here to give you an update. Um, thank you. We do also have uh, three Sodexo representatives uh, here that I'm going to go over a few uh, slides and then ask them, give them an opportunity to come up and uh, uh, speak to the board. But uh, just so you know who these individuals are, starting to the um, on the far end there, Mr. John White is a uh, Vice President uh, for the Mid-Atlantic Region. 
Uh, Ms. Sonia Bauer is uh, Director of Business Development, and Mr. George Higley is a, uh, a District Manager. Um, <clears throat> The uh, recommendation of the committee is that we are recommending uh, Sodexo uh, for uh, this uh, contract. Um, and this was a long process. This uh, RFP process was uh, done in strict accordance with federal and state guidelines. Um, the um, <clears throat> We had issued a, a RFP in December. We had a pre-bid conference in January. We received some um, re re proposals in uh, February. Uh, the evaluation committee evaluated the, uh, those proposals in strict accordance with the reward criteria that was spelled out in the RFP. And all the documentation included in this entire process, e every email communication that we had with each vendor the uh, RFP, all the questions uh, that the committee asked during interviews, the questions that were asked during uh, reference checks, uh, the minutes from the meetings and all that was sent to DOE and reviewed and approved. The contract that we'll be asking the board to vote on at the seven o'clock meeting uh, was approved uh, by DOE. It's also been reviewed by the county attorney uh, on our behalf. Um, and then um, also uh, we have done a very similar presentation to food service staff last uh, Wednesday. And uh, there were several questions asked um, in, in that. And one of the ones was is that is there a management fee that we're gonna be paying you know, for this service? And yes, there is. Uh, and that's basically like 13 cents a meal, but that's uh, within the cost of the contract. And I'll go over that uh, cost a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> this uh, contract, or actually this is a partnership, but um, there are many budget and student considerations uh, that we were thinking about as we go through this. Yes, one goal is to greatly reduce the subsidy um, that we currently have with food service, but the other goal is to increase student participation in our meals, and uh, both breakfast and uh, the lunch program. Now, as we go forward with this, all the federal and state guidelines that we have to meet, we still have to meet them, and that was part of the reason why DOE reviewed, you know, everything that we did every step of, what, of the way. They specifically um, reviewed the RFP so that it was uh, worded and the contract was worded so that all of those federal and state guidelines are still followed. We're still going to have inspections, uh, state and federal inspections. Those things uh, we still have to comply um, with um, all of those things. Um, but um, <clears throat> we also will have to have a uh, PCS in uh, Powhatan County School employee that is doing the federal reimbursements um, uh, because that is a uh, requirement. And this isn't just something that we will sign off on and wash our hands. This is a partnership. Uh, we'll be meeting with uh, Sodexo representatives at, at a minimum on a monthly basis to review where we are with things. <clears throat> there is also, in addition to the ability to uh, reduce and eliminate the subsidy, we also have the ability to, uh, in the future, once food service becomes self-supporting, to take some overhead expenses that we've always paid for out of the school budget. Overhead expenses such as electricity, uh, water, and things like that, telephones that we've paid for out of the general fund and we've never uh, charged them to food service even though we could under federal and state guidelines we haven't done so because they weren't up you know self-supporting anyway what's the you know what's the point but you know we can shift those uh, sometime in the future but that will be in, in an out year and those those expenses are in addition to the 200 plus thousand subsidy that we uh, do 
Now this has been a long process. This is not something that we just started this year. We've been making reports to the school board for over four years as to where we were with the food service operation. Uh, back in 2014, we did a very detailed report to the board that went over all of the um, challenges that the food service department was facing, all of the increased federal mandates, um, the declining enrollments, the uh, low percentage of free and reduced um, uh, you know, students that we have, uh, as well as mandated meal price increases and those type things to you know, show that there are a lot of things beyond the control of food service staff that are uh, hindering them in their uh, performance. Uh, then in 2017, we presented a financial report to the board that focused on the financial uh, status, went back for a 15-year period and showed what the subsidy was, uh, and also talked about student participation. We presented this chart to the board in January of 2017, and this is this 15-year financial analysis that shows that we've always uh, subsidized the food service department, and we went back to 2002, which was before the federal regulations started coming into play. And uh, so the average at this point in time was $216,000. Since this period, for the last two years, FY17 and 18, uh, the subsidy level has been $250,000. We also presented this chart uh, in January of 17 to the board. And what this chart does is it takes the um, percent of participation, the number of students as a part of enrollment that are participating in our meals, and it looks at what percent we would have to be at, assuming cost didn't increase as well, but we know they would. Uh, and you know, we determined that at the end of FY16, we were at about a 30% participation rate, but if costs didn't increase, we had to be at, you know, basically 47, we really needed to be at over 50. And at that point in time, it was just quite evident that, you know, we can do a whole lot of things, but it's gonna be quite difficult to uh, make up this uh, difference. So we have since that time, uh, uh, school, school food service staff and uh, Ms. Hill and so forth have made a lot of changes to try and get uh, uh, participation up. Um, we started uh, emailing uh, parents menus uh, each Sunday evening so that hopefully it would encourage students to buy a meal uh, the following uh, week. Uh, the uh, meal choices that students have has been increased at the high school and the middle school. We started this year with a breakfast program um, at all the schools, and we've seen some results of that. Uh, we have uh, seen some, uh, the um, sales have um, increased about 7% uh, since that uh, end of year 16. However, we've also had a little bit of increase in enrollment. We're still at the 30% participation rate. We've got to get to 50 to be self-supporting, and so, you know, worked real hard, but just, you know, we're not, we're not there. Um, they, you know, we still have the challenges of the federal regulations. Um, and, you know, I mentioned all of these, you know, before. The issue really is that it is very hard for a small school division to compete with a international company that has the buying power uh, plus the economies of scale of having a dietitian, having marketing people, that they spread those costs out over, you know, all the contracts they may have in a state. And we just, you know, can't do that in order to, and, and still, uh, you know, break even on that. It's just, uh, we're, we're just not able to do it in spite of everyone's desire uh, to do that. Um, and as I talk to references and so forth, I talk to a bunch of school systems, uh, Sodexo as well as the competitors, they all have overcome all of these challenges and turned every one of them into uh, self-supporting operations. And I, I talked to school systems that their percent of free and reduced was 16 to 20 percent, ours is around 18. I talked to some that were over 70 percent and you know, a lot of things in between. And they all 
maybe not the very first year became self-supporting, but the second year they did. And so I'm quite confident that uh, this uh, you know, can uh, happen. Um, I've already gone over, and so I won't spend too much more time on it about the you know, process, but you know, we started to do this RFP last year, but because of the time requirements and how long that review was by uh, DOE, we would have ended the school year and our employees would have gone home and we would not have been able to tell them what's going to happen for next year. So we put that on the shelf and waited until this year, started it a little sooner so that we were able to get through this process so we would uh, know um, where, where we are with it. When we put the RFP out, we had three options in the RFP. The first option required vendors that submitted a proposal to offer employment to all of our uh, cafeteria staff, but to um, protect their wages for the first year. The second option was offer them employment, uh, but the vendor would set the wages for whatever they were, uh, whatever the market forces were, whatever their strategies were. And the uh, third one was to just provide consulting services. You can see the criteria that uh, was spelled out in the RFP, and that's what the committee used to evaluate them. Price was a big component, 40%, but not the driving factor. And I'll tell you, uh, the firm that we're recommending didn't offer the biggest guarantee. They were you know, second in that. While that was important, there were other things that were also very, very important. The product plan for Powhatan and what they were going to do um, in order to achieve the goals of increasing student participation, how they were going to treat the staff and those type of things, client references and, you know, all of that. And uh, so those things were more important when we evaluated all of that. Sodexo, you know, quickly rose to the top. Um, I talked to over 25 school districts in Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, South Carolina, and even Florida. And they by far had, you know, uh, the best references. Also, in addition to that, went to websites to read reviews and comments and, you know, all of that. Um, one of the uh, primary reasons that um, we wanted to go with this firm and are recommending this firm is that in their alternate proposal, they proposed a 3% increase for uh, food service staff. The other vendors were proposing in their alternate plan that um, wages would be frozen for that year and some of them were going to freeze them for two and three years. They were going to cut hours and things like that. And that's not um, the atmosphere that we're looking for in this. I mean, this as we go forward, this is a partnership, not with just the school division and, and Sodexo, but it's a partnership with the employees too. And um, their, um, the fact that they did that, to me, speaks volumes to the fact that they want our employees to stay and work you know, where they are. Also in their uh, plan, they're not coming in and starting to make a whole lot of changes. Um, they, they will make marketing and uh, changes to let parents and students know that there is a change. But as far as changing, you know, how things are done, there'll be some changes to uh, menus and that kind of stuff. But that's not going to be immediate overnight. It's going to be, you know, more gradual. So everybody has uh, more of ability to um, adjust uh, with that. So their philosophy, you know, with the employees is more in line with what we, you know, have here in Powhatan and, you know, what we were looking for. There's also a good growth opportunity for our employees. Mr. Higley, you know, the district manager here, started off as a cafeteria worker and now he's a district manager. So some of our employees that are looking for that type of growth, there is the opportunity to do that. We did, as I mentioned last week, um, uh, let's see, I think I've gone over all those. We did last week uh, meet with all the food service employees and go over these things. We are scheduled, uh, assuming that the board at the 7 o'clock meeting does uh, award the contract, we are scheduled for Sodexo to meet with food service staff tomorrow uh, at the high school 
uh, in L100 uh, at 215 so that they can, you know, uh, start um, letting them know how things, you know, are going to be and what their plans are, what their benefits are, and, you know, all those type things. And speaking of benefits, there's one other reason that we went with Sodexo. Um, their benefit levels to, for example, health insurance uh, are, are close to what we have as far as the number of hours that you work in order to qualify for those benefits. One of the competitors, their work time requirements were above what our employees are doing now, so it effectively met. If we went with them, they wouldn't have health insurance available to them. One of the vendors uh, had health insurance available for the employee and their children, but not spouse. That's not the case here. Our, pre our employees that are on health insurance, their premiums uh, through payroll right now would be paid through into September. They're eligible to start uh, with Sodexo's health insurance on October. So no gap in coverage, and that's also very, very important. Um, so uh, what I would, um, th this contract would start July 1. There are options for us to renew it as a mutual <laughs> agreement. Uh, between, you know, uh, the school division and uh, Sodexo uh, up to four times, and then uh, after every five years you must uh, bid that. At this point time, I'd like to uh, ask the Sodexo representatives, representatives to come up and uh, provide some comments and uh, to the board. Good thank evening you, and welcome. So thank you so much. Um, we're, we're absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you for selecting Sodexo to be at your session this evening. I know Larry introduced my colleagues, um, but we are delighted to be here to share some of the highlights of our vision for the school nutrition program and for how we're going to take care of employees. So I know Mr. Johns touched on a lot of it, but I would like to reiterate, we were given the opportunity to adjust wages and it just felt really good to be able to give everybody a raise. I thought that was a great way to start. Um, so uh, I know George, George will be, be, be um, working with closely with those employees and it just makes for a much better partnership. Um, benefits, as Mr. John shared, employees will be eligible for their benefits the day after their Powhatan benefits expire. And that includes single, plus one, family, single with children. All of those benefits eligible employees will be able to, to get their benefits. And I will share also that those benefits are the very same benefits that, that John and George and I have. So, um, and um, should we be awarded the contract? Uh, we will be meeting with employees tomorrow, the high school, and our human resources partner, Eva Chung, will also be traveling down tomorrow morning to meet with them to answer questions. So I'd like to turn it over to Mr. George Higley. He's going to be sharing with you all of the wonderful things that he will be doing with the nutrition program and your employees. Good evening, everybody. And thanks for having us. It's a real pleasure to be here with you folks uh, in the great state of Virginia. Uh, 35 years for me this year, all the way back to Marriott. So my, my background is service and I'm the guy you're gonna see boots on the ground. Uh, as we open, I'm in, I really like working side by side with the employees. Back of the house, front of the house, and the other key cog is knowing our, knowing our students. So Sodexo is a global company, and we are big, but in my world that I operate in, which is the Mid-Atlantic, I like to think that it's customized to every school district because every community is different. Every single community is different. So we'll do our best to work. Uh, first and foremost is with the employees because I can be here, Sodexo can be here, but those are the folks that are gonna deliver the service. So it's critical, it was critical to me, talking with Larry, that as soon as uh, we were able to do it, to meet with the employees, because it's, it's change. So we wanna be able to communicate, you know, as best we can what's going on for them. Uh, as far as the marketing piece, they'll see some, uh, the kids will see the dynamics of that. You know, we have different marketing schemes. Taste 4 is the newest one that's coming out for the high school, it's pretty big. Uh, I would say your schools, I mean, unbelievable, high school, New facility, newer facility, but that middle school is going to be something. So we're really glad to be on board and help you open that up. And your older schools, the elementaries, I mean, just a, a great physical structures. All the staff that we met 
I mean, professional, friendly, so really appreciate being here. And I'll be around, so look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thanks, George. This is Mr. Virginia here. <laughs> Uh, at Sodexo, we fulfill our mission to improve the quality of life of those we serve. As a global leader in this space, we consider quality of life to be a key factor in our individual and our collective performance. We are certainly excited to be here, and we look forward to, after your approval vote, that uh, being a, a true partner, I heard the word partnership, we accept uh, that a, a partnership with this school district. We're excited again to be here. We are the communities we serve. We have uh, this, this guy here is one of the best operators that I have, and we're really so proud of him and the work that he's done in Virginia, and certainly proud of what we will do here with this partnership. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Jones? Or any of the other presenters? Mr. 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 Jones, uh, thank you, Mr. Yes, Chair. Sir. Yes, sir. You gave us a lot of reading to do uh, prior to this meeting, um, and I'm going to be honest, I, I did not get through all 230 pages of Sodexo's uh, proposal, mm -hmm. and, and but you did say that this has all been reviewed by DOE and also mm -hmm. by the county attorney, mm -hmm. so uh, you know, I, I, I do feel better about that because there were a lot of details in there that even after I read them, I wasn't 100% sure of what I'd read. Uh, so uh, I, I've you know, we are obviously very concerned about the transition, mm -hmm. and, and, and it sounds like you've done some things to help make that transition a smooth one. Uh, I'm very happy to see Sodexo here tonight and talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I'm very pleased about the 3% raise in the health insurance in particular and, and, and not having any gap in service. That means a lot. Our employees uh, are very, very important to us, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we're very, even though uh, we have not had the dollars, uh, the, the, the profit margin that we want to have had in the last few years. You know, we believe they are very valuable to us, and, and, and the relationships they've had with students have been very, very important over the years in lots of different ways to lots of different kids. So, so we're looking, you know, and as you've mentioned, this is a partnership, and, and we want it to work, and it's a partnership that, that – that if we decide to go that way, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to working to working well together with with the company and with with their food with their staff here at Powhatan, Osc uh, Powhatan County Schools. So, so it has been a long process, uh, and I, I appreciate your perseverance on it. And, and that's all the comment I have at this point. If right, I'm if I may add in uh, two responses, uh, Mr. Cole. One, the reason all that material is there is because both the Sodexo RFP, the Sodexo proposal, our RFP, um, the contract, and that budget become a, a combined document to be the contract. But uh, the other thing I want to say is that at our meeting with the food service staff last week, we stressed multiple times, and I'll stress it again tonight. We want, and Sodexo wants, our employees to stay working in our cafeterias. Their, you know, 3% proposal says that, and that is what we want because we do value them and we do need them. All right. Other, Ms. Ayers. I have one comment. Um, what I think that a lot of our employees are concerned, or what I've been hearing and Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith stated it earlier, is that the humanity, the relationship that we have with our children is not going to change, I hope. I mean, that's what I'm looking for you all to assure me and the employees that if a child comes through and can't afford something that we're not going to be able to have to say, oh, we can't give that to you. That I hope, because we are in a small community and we love our children, and if I see a child that wants an ice cream and I'm at school, I want to buy the child an ice cream. I mean, I just hope that the humanity of living in Powhatan isn't going to change the relationship with our employees and our children. It is not. And, you know, we, I mean, we have requirements of not singling children out and all that kind of stuff. We will comply, so that, so any vendor must comply with those things. But, you know, we do have the ability to cover those issues. And, you know, it's got to be a friendly environment. You know, if we're going to achieve the goal of 
increase in the participation, the students have to want to come in there and want to eat and participate. So um, that's the environment is very key. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions or comments? Ms. Emel. Um, as uh, Ms. Smith had mentioned um, at the beginning about um, our uh, custodial um, staff being outsourced, uh, that is a big concern, and we did have uh, quite a few problems um, afterwards. Um, and I think now, how many years has it been? More than six, more than right. five. five. Okay, <laughs> so it, it took some time, and but we, you know, if we decide to go with you, um, that's really important that you live up to your side of the bargain because they they weren't, and we, Mr. John says, or I'm sorry, it wasn't you, it was Mr. Wilson. Wasn't Russell it? Russell Wilson, and now uh, Mr. Tibbs. Right, are Dr. With Tibbs. The, the, the yeah, we expect you know that you them to live up to the contract as we would you if we did and so that's really really important if i vote for this and if i may that contract and this contract they're they're two different services and the reason the vendor has a vested interest in making this work is that this contract has a bottom line guarantee in that if they um, don't decrease our uh, subsidy to $10,000 uh, for next year, they've got to put up the money difference. And so what that means is that they have a vested interest in increasing sales and increasing student participation. And if they don't do that, uh, they'll pay the bill. And so um, we want to work together with them to do that. Uh, and I believe that it will happen. In all the references that I talked to, um, you know, first year might not have, uh, you know, become self-supporting, but second year they all did, and those things did, you know, happen. And and it's the whole it's the whole piece. It's just it's not just the bottom line. If you don't make the customer happy, if you don't have a staff that's happy and and trained, and a staff that is you know, good at giving good service, then the sales aren't gonna be there. So it's, it all has to work, and I, I fully believe it will. And all the references have told me that this company can do it. Okay. Well, I hope so, if, if we go with them, because we do have dedicated, hardworking employees out there and here, which some of them are, as well as in the schools. Um, so how many years is this contract, did you say five? It is a one-year contract with uh, an option for four renewals. So the maximum length of the contract would be five years. At the, as we near the end of that fifth year, we must go out to market again and do another RFP. But then we, if it, if it didn't work next year, then we can, we can get out of it if we needed to. It, it's, it, it could occur at any time, yes, ma'am. And there are provisions uh, to, for termination if that were to uh, be the case and the desire of the board. So if we tried it for one year and we didn't like it, we could? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. And there have been some divisions that you know, went out and then went, came back. So yes, it can be done. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Jones, I just have one question. If with our employees, those employees that have unused leave balances, what happens with those? Um, per our policy, uh, individuals with a leave balance um, can only be paid anything for that leave balance if they retire. Uh, we do have some of our food service employees that are eligible to retire and could retire uh, and go to work for uh, Sodexo and they would be paid uh, for, per the policy, for the balance uh, of that leave. Uh, those employees that are not eligible uh, to retire uh, would lose uh, whatever leave balance they have uh, remaining at June 30. Uh, and Unfortunately, you know, that does happen throughout the year to many employees uh, and because our policy is only if you retire. Okay. All right, so just in, in the interest of, of putting this into the room, 
Um, I was contacted by one of my constituents who mm -hmm. is a food services employee, mm -hmm. and she did express concern to me that we were hearing the presentation tonight, and then it is also on our on the agenda for the meeting later this evening to vote on an action on the contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we did talk a little bit about the fact that we have been engaging in this process for quite a while, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I did promise to her that I would put that in front of the board and express to you her concern that she shared with me, that again, she was concerned that we were hearing the presentation at the workshop and then voting on that action item involving numerous employees or several employees of the school district on the same evening without the opportunity for a, a, a period between both the presentation and the uh, vote. Mm -hmm. So I told her that I would share that with the board members. So I'm doing that at this point. Any if, other questions or comments? If I may add one. Well, we haven't, we're not voting at this point. So. Right, but so would we, we do we, what, what well, would, I, I think, okay, I, I think okay. we would discuss that later on okay. the next agenda. Right. So. This one thing I'd like to add also, we have a group of employees, food service employees, that are only working three and a half hours in food service. They're dual employees. They're still also working in transportation. There's no reason why those employees, you know, could not still do their transportation piece because it's outside of the hours they're working in the cafeteria. And if that's the case, the hours that they have can stay with them as an employee, as a dual employee. I mean, they wouldn't be a dual employee anymore, but they'd be working for Sodexo for the cafeteria times and still working in transportation. Those employees wouldn't lose that leave. Okay, so their leave would not expire or turn. Okay, very That's good. correct. All right, thank you, Mr. Johns. Yes, sir. All right, so th this is an important issue and though we do approach the end of our time, uh, are there any other questions? I certainly want the board members to have every opportunity to ask questions that they would like to, Mr. Johns. This is a very important issue. I, I just Mr. request that, that Mr. Johns and Mrs. Daxo be available at our next meeting if we do have questions. If, is that possible for them, yes, sir. for them to hang around? It is. It is. Right. Thank you very much. I, I don't have any other questions at this point, but there may be something that comes up before we get to the vote. All right. All right, hearing other questions, thank you both. Appreciate yes, it, or thank you all. Thank you for your comments. All right, so at this point, what I would uh, recommend is that while we do have an update on building and grounds uh, from Dr. Tibbs, I would suggest, unless any other members of the board uh, have strong feelings about it, that we defer that to our meeting. We add that as an agenda item to our meeting. And uh, what I would further suggest is be asking Ms. Emil in a moment if she would uh, be kind enough to make a motion, take us into closed session, read the necessary certification. But what I would ask is if none of the board has objection, rather than beginning our meeting at 8 o'clock, we will meet, at I'm sorry, 7 o'clock, we'll begin our meeting at 7.15. Is that sufficient? Any objection from any of the board members? And that way the public will be aware. All right, so our meeting is publicized and the agenda list seven o'clock. We will be starting just a bit late at 7.15. And we do apologize for that. During this workshop this evening, we've had two very lengthy presentations on two very important items, both school safety and also on this food services program. All right, Ms. Emil. I make a motion uh, that we enter into closed session. And the and certification. And sir, read it, okay. Uh, pursuant to code 2.2-3711A1 to discuss the employment, resignation, and leave of specific employees, and pursuant to code 2.2-3711A2 and A4 to discuss the expulsion and school placement of specific students. Codes 2.2-3711, A1, A2, and A4. Is there a second? Second. second. We have a second. All in favor, please respond with aye. Uh -huh. aye. Aye. Board is in closed session. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion we come out of closed session. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor, please respond with aye. 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 Ms. Emil. Whereas the Powhatan County School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification 
by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Powhatan School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and only public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Mm -hmm. Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. All right, so that takes us to the end of the workshop. The next item on our agenda would be adjournment of the workshop. Is there a motion to adjourn the workshop? So moved. Have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor of adjourning the workshop, please respond with aye. 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 Motion is carried 4-0. We are adjourned from the workshop.